the floor and it's all yours, please. Thank you. Uh, first, an apology to the translators. Uh, my text is going to depart significantly from what I gave them earlier because of what I said uh, this afternoon. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I used to be, uh, for a long time, a representative for Microsoft. I'm no longer a representative of Microsoft for a year, uh, and I'm now an independent advocate for privacy rights. I want to pick up on what has been said already on the subject of secret access to European data by foreign governments in the context of cloud computing. Industry is doing the hard sell on cloud computing with unprecedented tenacity and urgency. The reason is that they are afraid their customers may switch to competitors because of potentially enormous cost savings, perhaps as much as 90 percent. And many white papers and reports have been published recently claiming that U.S. laws for surveillance of data are no worse than yours in Europe and that concerns over the Patriot Act in particular are overblown. Cloud providers are transnational companies subject to conflicts of international public law. And the biggest threat is not from the Patriot Act, but from a law which is still largely unknown, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Amendment Act of 2008. And to the contrary, cloud computing is an immediate and grave threat to the sovereignty of European data. And none of the regulatory proposals so far have appreciated the gravity of the situation. Most surprisingly, it seems that the details of this law were unknown to the Commission or data protection authorities until last year. Section 1881A of the FISA Amendment Act, which I'll now call FISA, for the first time created a power of mass surveillance exclusively targeted at foreign data in U.S. clouds without any of the legal safeguards applicable to U.S. citizens. And I have to say that in direct contradiction of what you heard earlier from Mr. Schwartz. This law was passed in 2008 to legalize surveillance, which the U.S. government began around the time of 9-11, which became known as warrantless wiretapping. Mass surveillance of international communications using supercomputers to trawl through data has been practiced for a long time. And the system known as Echelon was itself investigated by the European Parliament in 2000. But the question which led to the warrantless wiretapping scandal was whether Americans' data was being caught up in these international surveillance systems. Senior technical experts and executives of the U.S. National Security Agency became whistleblowers because they were concerned that the rights of Americans were being violated. And I would recommend you all try to find online and watch the speech of William Binney, one of the whistleblowers, at a New York conference in June and consider yourself the implications of what he has to say about your data and data of Europeans. William Binney was an NSA engineer who built a vast data mining system for the NSA which was designed to do mass surveillance on foreign and international communications. But it is extraordinary that European policymakers, politicians and the press have not understood that they were the intended targets of the system that he built. The European press has been completely silent on this. Under the European Convention of Human Rights and EU Fundamental Rights, it is illegal to discriminate the protection according to nationality. Everyone in the jurisdiction of Europe has an equal right to have their privacy protected from unjustified surveillance. This US law only protects US persons. Moreover, in Europe, the legitimate purpose of covert surveillance is limited to combating serious crime, and national or economic security. Our human rights law prohibits state surveillance of the ordinary, lawful, democratic, political activities of individuals or groups. One member state cannot lawfully spy on another's citizens merely for some foreign policy objective or advantage. If that is not a genuine question of national security. This US law is different. It expressly authorizes surveillance of information with respect to a foreign-based political organization or foreign territory that relates to the conduct of the foreign affairs of the United States. Now, one has to ask, what is not allowed by that definition? This is a vastly broader definition than anything that is lawful under ECHR. 
Therefore, since 2008, foreigners' data in the cloud could be scanned for purely political surveillance. Any data which was moved to the cloud, which previously was processed on the premises of an EU organization, has been vulnerable. It is extraordinary that until last year, neither the Commission nor data protection authorities were aware of this situation. The Article 29 Working Party have just issued their opinion on cloud computing, and unfortunately, it is not going to solve these problems. Far from waking up to the risk of mass surveillance, they endorse mechanisms devised a decade ago for scenarios like outsourcing of direct marketing and call centers as suitable for the colossally greater risks of the cloud. At the end of their opinion, they do issue a stark warning that it is of the utmost importance to prohibit direct disclosures by cloud providers to non-EU governments, unless this falls within established international agreements. But Article 29 still seems to believe that the main risk comes from the Patriot Act and case-by-case -case demands for data. They do not seem to have appreciated the risk of continuous and systematic mass surveillance of cloud data. The software fabric of U.S. cloud providers is maintained from operation centers in the U.S., so mass surveillance is possible through remote control of EU data centers, and the U.S. could secretly order companies to comply. Therefore, any data put into the cloud could be accessed secretly and directly to bypass any agreements covering the law enforcement sector, such as the PNR or SWIFT agreements, and so forth. Moreover, dealing with the reality of FISA will mean changing the current plan for how to deal with the cloud in the new regulation. Over the past three years, Article 29 have developed so-called binding corporate rules and appear to believe they can provide adequate safeguards for cloud data. Article 29's new opinion on these BCRs fully envisage and permit secret disclosures of data. The loopholes have already been built in. However, they do say that disclosure should be put on hold and the DPA competent for the controller and the lead DPA for the BCR should be clearly informed about it. Let us imagine that the chief executive officer of a US cloud provider which has invested billions of dollars in its cloud strategy is faced with a choice between obeying those shoulds in the Article 29 opinion or contempt of the US courts. They would also stand to lose huge amounts of business through reputation damage. Which law are they going to obey? Unfortunately, there are no technical defenses from computer science uh, that are effective against these risks. Encryption of data to and from the cloud is irrelevant because FISA allows data to be extracted from inside the data center after the data has been decrypted for processing. In summary, there is no way that an EU data protection authority can know whether the cloud is wiretapped if the software powering the cloud is controlled from outside EU jurisdiction. Mass surveillance of the cloud would be done in software, using the power of the cloud itself to scan and filter data for further analysis. Huge new data centers belonging to the National Security Agency are being built for this purpose. But no commercial audit process can possibly uncover secret use of national security laws of another country. Until this problem is fixed by revising US legislation or a satisfactory treaty, the only prudent policy is physically confining cloud data to facilities exclusively under EU jurisdiction and preferably use open source software because the risk that backdoors might be inserted into closed source software, which Pfizer can order. Closing the legal loopholes for cloud surveillance is not enough, however. Whether the infraction is for complicity in government surveillance or for commercial malpractices, it is just not credible that national data protection authorities will be able to mount effective enforcement actions against companies the size of Microsoft or Google. Imposing a $1 billion fine on Microsoft for competition offenses took the EU nearly 10 years during which time Microsoft derived profits which were many multiples of the size of that fine. A 2% fine for data protection offenses under the regulation could be of comparable size. But the reason the Microsoft case took so long is that Microsoft could afford to employ dozens of black belt lawyers to tie the case up in knots. The same thing will happen when data protection authorities try to make a large fine stick under the regulation. And moreover, if personal data is really the new oil, as the OECD have said, 
then 2% will be seen as a small cost of doing business to access the 500 million consumers of the EU. What is needed is a dedicated and centrally operating prosecution authority, the idea mentioned by the Belgian Data Protection Authority this morning, for major cases of transnational data protection enforcement and with the capacity to fight long legal battles with adequate professional resources. The authority must proceed under the instruction from the new Data Protection Board and be completely independent of Commission influence. Only in this way can enforcement become sufficiently credible to alter corporate behavior. Now, I have a little bit more. I don't know if I have some Chairman's indulgence for one more, two more minutes. I think we've survived. <laughs> to provide a credible deterrent against U.S. companies simply disregarding EU data protection law and hoping not to get caught, very substantial rewards have to be offered to corporate whistleblowers. They must be of sufficient size to overcome the risks of breaking U.S. secrecy laws and so must offer cast iron legal protection as well. These methods have been effective against tax evasion and competition cases. Why not for data protection? It is not too late to wake up from a long sleepwalk towards an irreversible loss of data sovereignty, but the EU institutions must resolve the question of who is responsible for this issue. Unless third countries are prepared to offer Europeans the same protections which they offer their own citizens, the clouds will have to part. Thank you very much.